Okay, so those are minimum requirements. We're gonna get into modeling. Um, you can unmute your mic if you have any questions about that portion of the scenario I, or that portion of the presentation. I'll take a few questions on that. But if there's no questions, I will just I'll just get into modeling. So, okay, looks good. So now I will share. So this is um, WWHM 2012, and if someone in the chat, just make sure that uh, you're seeing that screen, WWHM 2012. I just want to make sure everyone uh, sees me modeling. So, okay, good. I got a thumbs up on that. I'm. Oh, the meeting chat is muted. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Let me unmute. Okay. Okay, so people able to unmute now. I'm more familiar with Zoom, so <laughs> making sure people can unmute. If you also have a question, you can just put it in the chat and I can answer it there for you because um, I have that pulled up as well. Okay. Now we're going to model a scenario here in WWHM 2012. So I'm just going to assume that uh, you don't have any modeling experience, which is fine. Everyone's going to have different degrees of modeling experience, but this was really meant to be a basic workshop anyway. So. I have my schematic here when I pull up WWHM 2012 and the first thing we're going to do is select a location on the map, left click. Um, this little patch right here just happens to be SeaTac Airport and it has a precipitation factor of 1.000. So you're selecting a rain gauge and the gauge is SeaTac and if I click around here um, you'll get different results for that. So I'll get SeaTac again, SeaTac again. Um, but what the precipitation factor is doing is it's understanding that even amongst the rain gauge, the elevation of that specific location is going to be different. It's not going to be the same. And we know rainfall and precipitation is going to be affected by elevation. So if we're you know, really high up, a you know, thousand feet up on a mountain and then closer to sea level, uh, the precipitation will be different even if the rain gauge is accounting for all that area. So um, that's the reason for the precipitation factor. It's just sort of correcting that based on your location. And, that's, and now we've derived um, our rain uh, data our precipitation data for when we run uh, the model now if we go to the schematic here you see there's a pre-developed and there's a mitigated scenario the pre-developed shows uh, grass and trees and then the mitigated scenario shows like a house and a pond right so that's pretty self-explanatory what we're going to do is we're going to show a simple scenario where we're modeling to meet minimum requirement number seven for our flow control standard so we have our land use basin. You're going to left click, left click again. You can drop the land use basin in your modeling space. I'm just going to name it pre-developed just for some clarity here. I also do want to mention on the map that site name, address, and city, this does not affect your project results at all. However, when you go to make a report of your project, um, it will then show up if you put uh, values in there. So if you want to put your site name, address, and city in your project, that will then show up in your report. And WWHM does auto generate a report essentially to um, for your project so that can be pretty useful anyways I've dropped in my uh, basin and have misspelled it there we go pre-developed and here's what we're gonna do for the scenario we're gonna put in four acres of sea forest flat or till soil so there's four acres of sea forest flat it's almost like this was just a you know empty lot with trees on it and then the a developers come along and they want to develop it that's kind of the scenario that we're looking at here. So if we right click, we can go connect to point of compliance. And what connecting it to the point of compliance does, it just allows you to analyze uh, that specific element or that specific routing. And I'm selecting surface flow and inner flow here and clicking connect. So now that's connected to the point of compliance. I'm going to run the scenario. So now it's generating that pre-developed data. And then we're going to put in our developed land use. Okay, just checking the chat. Everything looks good. Okay, so now that is run. Now we're gonna left click and go to the mitigated scenario. Let's put in our land use basin. And now let's say that that patch of land that we had, that four acres of forest that was undeveloped, the developers come along and say, hey, I wanna put um, some uh, development, some homes there or something. You know, pretty common situation. So I've got my developed 
land use here. And here's what I'm going to do with this. Let's say a half an acre of this uh, was left as forest. They just decided to do that. One acre was seed lawn flat, so I've got one and a half acres. If you go to the bottom left of your basin form, you can see the pervious total area and the impervious total area down here, so that's pretty useful. Then let's say another acres of roads was being added, um, a half acre of roofs flat were being added to this, and then we're gonna we're gonna have a half acre of our driveways. Uh, we have half and yeah, half acre of our driveways, and then a half acre of sidewalks. So this is now our developed scenario. We're going to connect this to the point of compliance, and then we're actually going to run this and look at the analysis tab. Now, judging by what you've seen before, um, this will not meet minimum requirement number seven because we have all this extra impervious runoff now generated from the site. So it it will absolutely uh, blow through the blue line, but that's fine. We know that. Now it's about just installing the stormwater mitigation method to um, meet minimum requirement number seven, essentially. So now we've run the scenario, let's go to the analysis tab here. And if we click point of compliance one, and we pull up the graph here, the, the default here, I just wanna let you guys know, is stream protection duration. So it'll, and stream protection duration is minimum requirement number seven, essentially. So there's that blue line. And there's that red line. So our facility completely failed, right? And we expected that. We added a whole bunch of impervious area to it, um, a whole much, whole bunch more runoff. So that is that is expected here. So how are we going to meet minimum requirement number seven? Well, we could add a detention facility, which is exactly what I'm gonna do. This is a trapezoidal pond. And we're gonna model this element here. So first thing I'm going to want to do is disconnect this from the point of compliance because now our, our pond is the point of interest. Let's go connect element and you do that by right clicking, select connect element and then connect that to the pond here, just the surface flow and interflow for now. Okay, so how are we going to model this pond element? And there's a number of ways you can do this and um, it just is really going to be called upon what kind of project you're running and, and what you're trying to do. Um, a good place to start is by selecting quick pond and all quick pond does is fill the cells with values. It, it, it's not doing any calculations. It's the same every time. It's just allowing you to run the project again with, with this element. So if I go connect to point of compliance here, um, we've got a 200 by 200 pond with a depth of seven feet. Now I'm going to run this scenario. So now all this runoff is now going to this detention facility. There's no infiltration selected and this is really going to depend on as well. Um, where your project site is because some project sites have really great uh, infiltrating soil and some project sites don't have good infiltrating soil or maybe there's a certain restriction maybe there's um, you know, pollutant runoff heading into that detention facility and then maybe there's a water table somewhere nearby a high water table that you can't let it uh, infiltrate into Um, so now that is finished, if we go to the analysis tab, we click on point of compliance one. And uh, if we look here, it'll perform better, but I don't expect this to pass at all. And I'll, and I'll explain why, um, mostly because it was just a randomly, or not randomly generated, but a uh, just a template generated pond, and it's not often going to work for your specific project. So there's the pre-developed uh, pre flow, there's the mitigated flow. You can see it did pass for some of the flows. We're, we're getting closer, but it's uh, it's not nearly as close as it needs to be. And uh, it seems to be failing uh, quite, a, quite a bit on the lower flows, and that's what you'll find. So someone might say, okay, it didn't pass for all these flows. What if we just made the facility bigger? And that's one option. So I'm just gonna show you what that does. Let's say, okay, let's make this 300 feet by 300 feet. Let's, let's see what this does. We run the scenario again.
So you can see this is a definitely an iterative process, um, and depending on the size of your project, maybe uh, we'll, we'll probably more, be more in depth than this. But this is just a, a basic, uh, you know, a basic project setup to sort of grasp the idea of minimum requirement number seven. So if we look at the graphs here for our pre-developed and uh, developed scenario, right? We made the facility bigger, right? So it's going to hold more water. So is, is that going to help? Well, we'll see. And sort of, it does help a little bit. Uh, we do pass for now half the flows. So someone might say, hey, what if we made it 400 by 400? But here, here's what's happening here. Um, you'll find that, yes, making the facility bigger will help it pass for more flows. But look how big this facility's gotten. It's 300 by 300. Who knows how big it needs to be to make it pass for all the flows. And you'll find that actually, um, even if I made this like 10,000 feet by 10,000 feet, it actually wouldn't pass for some of the smallest flows. What really is key is the outlet structure. How you design your outlet structure and your orifice is actually going to have the most impact on the size of your facility. Yes, bottom length and width uh, does matter, but um, these actually are in the end going to have a bigger impact on um, how well you're able to mitigate the facility. So here's the solution. So, um, so here's the solution to this situation. You're going to want to use auto pond or i mean you can design this by hand continue to modify the outlet structure and the orifice data go back run it and do it a million times or you can have auto pond do it for you so auto pond is our feature that allows you to size that pond to meet minimum requirement number seven and it's going to go through all these iterations that we've been seeing here so what i would suggest is for the most thorough analysis if you slide this slider all the way to the right that's going to take the most time, but it'll give you your best designed pond here. And what you'll find is that it's going to be messing a lot with this orifice structure data. And then you go create pond. And now this will begin to model your pond for you and help you meet that minimum requirement number seven. Now, if I drop this down here, as it begins to model, um, typically it'll modify these parameters, parameters while, the, while it's running. And you'll see the length and width actually come down quite a bit because it's modifying that outlet structure data. So that's going to be really the key to modeling a situation like this would be using AutoPond. But like I said, you can, um, you know, use you know a by hand iterative process to change that length and width and to modify um, your facility here. You'll find that some other elements in WWH in 2012, like our storage tank. And our vault and our bioretention have some of those automated features and then some don't but we just want to um, put those in there because it really is going to drop your modeling time down uh, quite a bit when you're able to do that unless you have a really uh, specialized project or you're dealing with an existing facility that you need to to put the dimensions in for um, we did not i also want to note we did not enable infiltration for this facility like i said once we enable infiltration things actually start to get uh, quite complicated or it's, it's just much more in-depth analysis, but may apply uh, to your project. So this is going to take, I mean, I may not have this go um, the, the full way. It usually takes maybe five to 10 minutes for AutoPond to finish sizing uh, a facility of this size. But as you can see here, a bottom length and width are already down uh, to 77 by 77. So that's a big uh, decrease from where we were 300 by 300 is a, we're getting, getting to be a pretty large facility. Um, 76 by 76 it's a pretty uh, much more manageable the cost is going to be uh, quite a bit down so while this models um, if anyone has any questions about um, WWHM anything uh, related to that clear creek solutions or modeling you could definitely uh, put it in the chat or just uh, unmute your mic it's up to you but um, or you can just watch this okay we got a question here the program on my terminal keep showing messages like too many zero, zeros yet if clicking on on okay then it keeps giving graphic analysis or generating reports do I need to worry about the analysis itself it's a program on my terminal just showing messages like too many zeros um, there are some situations where it will it will give too many zeros if clicking on okay then it keeps giving graph um, I guess I would just have to know what your project looks like. So our, um, this is, sorry if I pronounce your name wrong, uh, Weming Bayan, that's probably not how you pronounce your name. Um, I would probably have to know what your project looks like. Are you, are you running 
my scenario or is this a different scenario that you're running? Um, because if it's your own project and, and you're getting a message like that, then sometimes it's just good for us to look at it so you can um, e email us that WDM file and we'll tell you why it's giving you uh, that message. Um, the best way to transfer Do you plan to run a scenario with a wetland as one point of compliance? I think we'll need to use WHM soon for that kind of situation. Women says basically same smaller project. Thanks. Um, yeah, sometimes with really, really uh, much smaller projects, it will it will say, I'm meant to be separate. That yeah, no problem. Um, sometimes with really small projects, you will get that um, message, and then it'll tell you that and continue to analyze it. Just because there's just so little runoff that sometimes it's it's tough for it to um, model it correctly. Um, if you're worried about it, just like I said, send it, send us an email. Um, you know, reply to brasherjr at clerkysolutions.com and I can help you uh, make sure everything's running smoothly uh, with that. But yeah, you will get that. I'm just planning to run a, with a wetland scenario as one point of compliance. So I did not plan on running a wetland scenario here. We have um, some wetland mod modeling in our more uh, advanced courses, but I will explain um, kind of how that's done because I've worked on wetland projects before. Um, Basically, my experience with it is you you set up your wetland area in a pre-developed scenario. Um, you you run it and right. We're not trying to meet flow duration seven, obviously. So we're just going to run it there, um, and then whatever changes is happening to your project in your developed scenario, you include that in the developed scenario. But also have your wetland area, and sometimes it can be in the form of a basin. It will depend on your project, but it'll be in the form of a basin, and then you can have the points of compliance connected to your first wetland in the pre-developed scenario and your wetland in the mitigate scenario, uh, run them both, and then you can check the, the wetland input volumes and um, see if it's within within the range there. That will give you a good idea if uh, you have a chance with your um, wetlands of meeting minimum requirement number eight. So there's a lot of complications when it comes to modeling wetlands and also how it's receiving that water, especially in the developed scenario, because if there's a lot of impervious runoff heading to that wetland, there's actually some, some better ways to do it. Um, so it, it really might depend. I have Mark Opes and he said, in what scenario do you need to add the pond surface to the impervious surface area for the model? This is a great question. I was hoping I'd get this question. So um, this is running here. I think maybe I can pull up the basin while I do this. Let's see here. So what I what I have here is a half acre of forest and I have all these impervious areas. What I maybe could have done for this scenario is instead of saying, okay, there wasn't a half acre of sidewalk flat in this scenario and I could have gone, let's do a half acre of pond. Um, I definitely could have done that. It would, it's all the same area. So all the impervious area acts the same. So water is considered to be impervious area uh, in the model. So maybe a 100% a more accurate way of me doing this would say was saying, um, okay, actually there wasn't sidewalk in that impervious, um, or in the developed scenario, excuse me, there wasn't sidewalk and I should have put a half acre aside for my pond. That probably would have been a, a better way to do this because like I said, all the impervious area is the same. So you really want to keep track of it. If you have a weird scenario where, it, or if you have a scenario where you have your pre-developed and then your developed scenario, it's all pervious area again, and then you're modeling the pond, you'll want to make sure you set aside a chunk of that area to be impervious. Then watch the size of your pond, because we'll get done here, 1.216 acre feet, or you can actually open up the pond table to see how much area that's taking up, and then you can adjust make the pond area bigger or smaller, and then credit it back more towards um, your other areas in the project. That was kind of a long answer. Mark, you can you can um, reply again if that didn't completely answer your question, but hopefully that was, that was an okay explan explanation of that. But that is a great point. Uh, Women says, fun, a few facilities include, uh, fund a few facilities include outlet structure, 
particularly the infiltration trench, the correct input to deactivate the riser and orifice because the agency criteria is fully infiltrated. Fund a few facilities include outlet stra um, If you reword that question, I don't know exactly. The correct input. Oh, means no outlet. Okay. So no riser outlet structure for the infiltration trench. Um, could you just retype that question out? I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm being a little dense. I just want to make sure I understand uh, what you're trying to say. Mark says, great, basically it is an iterative process. Absolutely is an iterative process because um, the pond area will change. You'll have to go back, change what it looks like in your, in your project and sort of try and, and there is a point where it will all converge and it will all make sense, but uh, He's right. It just will take a, a few going back and forth, but that's a, uh, that's part of the gig, I guess. So you can see auto ponds still running. It'll be done here shortly. Um, where it's getting everything, uh, uh, matched up here. So now it's down to 74 by 74. Most of the work has done with the orifice diameter and you'll find that just the, the smallest changes in the orifice diameter are really going to have an impact. I'll send an email to explain. That's fine. Just send me an email. That's and I'll, and I can talk to you about it too. Um, just to make sure I I fully understand what you're trying to say. We understand that um. You know this is all this is there's some complicated things here and um you know Washington Department of Ecology has has their way of doing things and then we're trying to implement it correctly in the model and and sometimes it doesn't always. Um, 100% translate between the two. So we want to make sure we can uh, help people with that. Okay. Okay, so autopon's finished. That's great. About time, right? But it's actually pretty quick for, um, if you understand how much iter how much iteration, how much uh, the algorithm is doing, uh, autopon is actually uh, pretty impressive. Obviously for a larger project, it's, uh, it's going to take more time. But it's done here. If we go to our analysis tab, we go to POC1. And uh, we look at those those scenarios here. I see someone has a question, I'll get to that in a second. So as you can see, it passes for all the scenarios here, right? So this is, yeah, this is a basic modeling scenario, but that's kind of what this uh, this was intended for. But basically now our facility is passing. Um, it's 74 by 74 with a six inch, or excuse me, six feet. Um, that happens sometimes, the 